Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this session of the Macquarie Technology Summit. As part of the summit, we're bringing together leading technology investors across the globe. At the forefront of that group is Robert Smith. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. Over the last two decades, since its founding in 2000, this has completed over 500 transactions, uh, building into 75 billion of assets under management across 70 portfolio companies uh, that employ over 70,000 employees, uh, largely focused on the enterprise software vertical. I'll give you a quick back, uh, information on Robert's background. He'll correct me if, I've, uh, if I said anything wrong. He's from Denver, Colorado. Both his parents were school teachers. Um, he, uh, after high school, where he did an internship at uh, Bell Labs, he was a chemical engineering major at Cornell University. Following that, uh, jobs at Goodyear Tire and Rubber and Kraft General Foods uh, before getting his MBA at Columbia University in New York, graduating in 1994 and making the transition to investment banking at Goldman Sachs, where he segued into the uh, technology sector, moved to San Francisco, uh, left Goldman in 2000 in order to start Vista Equity Partners. Robert, thank you for joining us and thank you for the continued partnership with Macquarie. Well, uh, Tom, thank you so much and really appreciate the invitation. It's so good to see you. Let's jump right into the questions. And while the focus of the conference is for a better future and looking into the future, we find it's helpful to start with the past and some of the lessons learned from the past. For your background, Robert, you know, I might describe it as a little bit of an atypical background for someone that heads into investment banking, um, chemical engineering major, uh, internship at Bell Labs, Goodyear, Kraft General Foods, um, certainly not the uh, the tried and true path to get to uh, to get to investment banking. Tell us how some of those things impacted you, impact the way uh, you think about the world, uh, and, and moved you towards technology investing. Sure, uh, you know when I think about it, you know we, you and I, you know, grew up as as at the dawn of the computing age, and you know various elements of when it impacted our lives is 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 how it you know, how we got introduced to it, it really started to inspire and inform us as to what the opportunity set was. You know, mine started off early in high school. They introduced computers in my in my high school. I got to take a computer class and I asked the, the teacher, well, how do these things work? And, you know, he was telling me about this thing called a transistor. And I said, well, well, who made that thing? And he said, well, this place called Bell Labs. And so I went and found out that there was a Bell Labs in, in my town, uh, not too far out of town. And I gave him a call and I said, hey, you know, I'm uh, interested in, in an internship, do you have those available? And they said, well, yeah, sure, if you're between your junior and senior year in, in college. And I said, well, I'm a junior in high school, and I'm taking AP classes, getting A's in them, so it's just like being in college, where do I sign up? And uh, they, of course, said, no, you have to be a junior in college. So <laughs> I tell the story, I, I, I called uh, the human resources person every day for two weeks. Um, and of course, she stopped taking a call after the second day, uh, but I left a message. And then literally every month or every Monday, for five months, uh, I, I called and left a message and I got a call back in June and said a student from MIT didn't show up. Um, we were not guaranteeing anything, why don't you come down and, and interview? So interviewed, ended up getting a job and then worked there pretty much uh, almost every semester uh, and in the summers um, when I was uh, then matriculating through through Cornell. And, you know, I, I say that to say, you know, the, the exposure and experience that I got working in Bell Labs and what I saw, you know, the power of computing uh, technology you know, really shaped and informed my desire to to not only you know be an inquisitive uh, uh, scientist, but also create and invent things that were were heretofore you know never seen before. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons I went into chemical engineering. You know, they, I call you know the chemical engineers are the modern day alchemists. Now, today, computer scientists are now becoming the modern day alchemists. Chemical engineers transform one one form of matter to another. You know, if you think about it, you know the the computer scientists now transform ideas. Uh, into function. And so, you know, I had the opportunity to, you know, go into chemical engineering and then work uh, in applied research and development, you know, Goodyear, Kraft, a bunch of other places uh, where I learned the power of computing. It was in those environments where we were really digitizing uh, the industrial operations of manufacturing companies. And that was when, you know, at a time, you know, computing power was really managed by, you know, the government or large, you know, companies or, 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 you know, schools and universities. And for the first time, we're now starting to buy computers, you know, multi millions of dollars and cooled, cooled rooms, 
uh, to now control process controls. And what you saw was when you implemented these process controls, you eliminated massive amounts of inefficiency or waste, uh, which increased the production or decreased your cost of manufacturing. And then that started to get introduced into the workplace uh, in terms of you know, spreadsheets or word processing, et cetera. And so that really just highlighted to me the importance of, of embracing and leveraging technology in all business environments. And now we all know we're in this dawning of this fourth industrial revolution where, you know, and in my view, you know, every industry is getting uh, digitized, but almost as importantly or most importantly, you know, enterprise software, business software is the most productive tool introduced in our business economy in the last 50 years and likely will be for the next 50. So that's the exciting world I get to live in day to day. But it all started from an internship at Bell Labs. Got it. Thank you for that. So it's 2000. You go and you start Vista. We said we're going to do buyouts of software companies. And I, and I remember this. And people said, you can't do a technology buyout. And you, the, one of the most interesting things, Robert, was people said you can't lever the business. Um, and the, the irony of that is you look at the businesses today that we put leverage on. It's probably one of the most highest leverage sectors that we look at. Um, so things have come a long way since 2000, uh, but clearly you saw something that other people didn't see at the time. What, what was the, you know, what did you see? What was the aha moment? What, what were, what did you have the foresight to see the others did Yeah. So Tom, it's a great one because there are, were, there were a few, and one of the most important I mentioned earlier was the, you know, if you think about it, that, that enterprise software is the most productive tool introduced in the business economy, you know, last 50 years. If, you know, if you look back in the, in the olden days, you know, when you were implementing an enterprise software system for payroll, you would go to a company like Exxon. Exxon would have, you know, 80,000 employees. And they'd have, you know, 3,000 payroll clerks, right? Managing all the, you know, the day-to-day -day and the weekly payroll and exempt, not exempt, you know, all those sort of things. Well, you implement a payroll system and now all of a sudden you only need 30 payroll clerks, right? And so that efficiency where you could actually deploy those resources other places is one of the main reasons that people buy enterprise software. I look at our portfolio today, and I do a survey every year, and you know, our average company delivers software to their customers that delivers to their customers a 625% ROI, return on investment. That's how productive software is, even in today's environment where computing power is, has been you know, even more distributed. So that's kind of point one, massive productivity for the people who use software. So that's point one. Point two, Enterprise software, very differently, uh, when you actually standardize on it in a company and you realize those productivity benefits, you don't really want to lose them again. So, you know, you're not likely to switch vendors all that often unless a superior product shows up, uh, which gives you superior value or value creation. And that superior product is easy to use or easy to train uh, your, your existing employees because once you get employees on a system, they don't want to move to another system. You, you remember, you, you got on the Goldman about the time when we switched to Excel. Prior to that, we used a software program called Asterix. It was a, it was a, a, a spreadsheet program. Prior to that, we had, you know, right? Lotus one, two, three, right? And so remember the inefficiencies when we used to model and one person was working on Lotus and another person was working on Multiplan and another person was working on Excel and then you had to figure out whoever had the best model, you standardized on whatever system you used. That was massive inefficiency. Now we all use one. And so that creates a mass, it's that massive inefficiency, not only across that company, but across an entire industry. When we're doing a deal and we're sharing an Excel spreadsheet with our investors, you know, they don't have to worry about the conversion because they're using the exact same spreadsheet. Okay. So you think about that. So that's the second thing that was important. The third thing is, you know, you always have to go through a process in, in software because someone wants greater feature, function, capability, delivery. You have a relationship with your customers. That relationship isn't days or weeks or months or quarters. It's decades. And when you put all of those elements together, you say, man, that's a pretty good you know, investment thesis. Now, the banks 20 years ago said, well, the thing is, your customers leave, or your, your, your assets, I'd be your employees, leave the building every single day. Yeah, in venture and in startup, but when you have an established product and you have customers, you've had them for decades, your assets is that customer base and those contracts and those relationships and the value that you bring to that customer every day. And that's why there's been a realization over the last 20 years that you can lever these businesses seven times versus when we first started this thing, you know, you couldn't lever these things one time. 
<laughs> recurring revenue was not, uh, and SaaS were not terms people were using back then. Um, <laughs> so if, if, we're, we were, if we were sitting together back in San Francisco at Goldman 21 years ago, and you said, I'm going to go do this, Tom. And I said, hey, Robert, let me, I've got a crystal ball. I'm going to tell you something. This is what this is going to look like 21 years from now. What, what would you have said to me? It wouldn't be that different. Um, you know, the, the, the point to Vista is to create an efficient system to enable enterprise software executives, companies, you know, to, to be more effective in what they do. So beyond what I'll call the investment dynamic that we focus on, there's a, there is a value creation dynamic, which is a big part of our heavy lifting. What I noticed early on in this venture is Every single CEO, every single executive in the world of enterprise software did things differently. Well, why? Well, where did they learn how to run a software company? Well, they often just made it up, right? You know, because they were the first ones in that industry to offer this product. So they made up pricing. They made up go-to-market strategies. They made up, you know, market coverage. They made up product development, um, you know, strategies. And, and no one, you know, kind of converged on any one system because no one knew which one was necessarily better. And what we did, and which is what I would have articulated 21 years ago, was why don't we do what we do in every other industry, which is establish a set of best practices. You know, our days, at, in, in, you know, I'm, you, you have it at Macquarie. I'm sure you have best practices in terms of how you do certain things. And so when you have a new banker come on, you teach them these best practices. Same sort of a thing. We have a new executive and team come on. We say, Here's what has worked in the past for 500 transactions. Here's the things that you are different that you know are, are doing that could, could could help you accelerate your go to market or manage or you know go from a small to medium business to an enterprise sales uh, organization or to manage and decrease the cost of, of delivery of your product. And so that's what we offer is a systemic approach to bringing these value added components to every single software company that we partner with. And that was what I would have said 21 years ago. And that's what we do today. Now, what's interesting is that has to all evolve. You know, 21 years ago, we talked about ASP, application service provider. Today, we talk about, you know, um, a, a cloud hosted environment. On the one hand, they're not that different. They are, but they aren't that different. But the delivery mechanism is very different. So you have to modify your best practices, which we have over the last 20 years to meet the needs of the companies that they that, that we are we are investing in today. Very different than the needs of the companies that we had even five years ago or eight years ago. Okay, so look look forward now, the next 21 years from here, competitions come in, everybody's putting capital into the software space, all the large private equity, the growth players, you got people coming in on the value side. I think you've touched on some of the answers to this question already in some of your comments. You know is what, what's left in software investing? Is it look as good now as it did 21 years ago? How do you drive Vista forward for the next two decades? Yeah, I would say it is even better. Um, you know, Vista's gone through today kind of three phases of growth. You know, the early days, everything was on-prem, right? On-premise, enterprise software. You know, the, the business model was a standard license maintenance model. Uh, then there was an introduction of what I'll call it accessible computing power. We all call it cloud, right? And then there was, okay, well, how do I move from my on-prem to cloud and manage hybrid environments, which is what a lot of legacy companies did. But, you know, so that's kind of phase two. And I think we've migrated to move more businesses into, into the cloud. And of course, the SaaS business model, which supports, which supports that sort of a, a deployment um, than probably any institution I know of on the planet. You know, we've done 500 and 10 transactions or so. And today, if you think about it, you know, we are investing in cloud native companies. You know, what happens, they have low, lower operating costs, lower startup costs, but you have to have a different motion for your go-to-market motion. So now we are focused on a lot of companies that grow at scale, you know, companies that are two, $300 million in revenue growing 20%, and we want to inflect them so they can grow at 40%. But what do you have to do to do that? You know, how do you manage your go-to-market motion? How do you manage your product development, your service delivery? Those are the best practices that we've been refining and have been for the last five to eight years versus what we're doing, you know, eight and 10 and 15 years ago. And so our experience at doing more deals than anyone else in the space, getting that and then having a mechanism through Vista Consulting Group, our value creation organization, you know, that is the way that we are constantly able to what I call tune and, and feed forward, you know, innovations and insights that we develop or that we've developed with our portfolio companies uh, so that they can redeploy them into new companies. So that's one of the ways we, we call it, you know, keep our edge, keep our advantage and have the ability. And look, now we still get 
literally hundreds of calls from you know founder run companies and they only call us because they say, look, I want you to do for me exactly what you did at, at Marketo or at Jam for any of those companies that doubled their growth rate and doubled their size. Uh, and that's what we want to see in terms of how we, you know, how, how what we want to do with our company going forward. And so that, that, you know, that brand and that advantage is something that we continue to, uh, you know, to expand on. Great. Thank you. So shifting gears a little bit, and I think about the answer to this next question in more context of hardware, like an iPhone, uh, you may think more in the context of, uh, of software. Um, if you look at the last 20 years, what, what was the, the one tech not, technology or item that's uh, impacted society the most? And as we look forward over the next 20 years, um, you know, what do you see as the next focus area, be that a product or, or a sector? So there are three main forces that I always point to that really are driving uh, what we're experiencing. The first is the, the accessibility of computing power. That's the first thing, you know, again, 20 years ago, you know, there was just certain institutions that held all the computing power. Probably by next year, we will have shipped more servers and computer power in Asia than we shipped in the US, okay, which is going to be a huge inflection point. That computing power, so that's kind of point one, you, you know, the accessibility or ubiquity of computing power. The second thing is a connectivity of that computing power. You know, many investment banks and investment bankers over the last 20 years have, have encouraged uh, and, and aided and the connectivity of that computing power through, you know, all of the, the, the vendors, you know, the, you know, all of the, the wireless and, and, and you know, uh, cable companies, et cetera. Now that computing power is accessible to all of us on these little devices that we have in our pockets and on our desktop, which is the third thing, which is our IOT, right? These, you know, the internet of things or the internet of everything, you know, these devices now have in their own instance, the capacity to leverage that computing power, sometimes with instruction, sometimes they have their own ability to do it, which is part of the next wave of things. And those are the three major forces that are gonna to continue to drive opportunity in this space. Massive, massive productivity can be accomplished and realized, uh, you know, much more so than what we've seen in the last 20 years. And so what we're now, of course, doing is looking to harness the power of what I think in, in all of that stack, uh, the greatest productivity tools, which is the software. I mean, ultimately the hardware uh, is commodity. It, it, it ultimately has without, you know, if you don't build it properly, it's got a life cycle associated with it. Whereas the software has infinite flexibility and capacity uh, in the way that we are managing software today. And by the way, we can now implement, you know, AI tools or RPA tools that make it even more efficient and self-tuning and self-learning going forward. So that's where we're going to continue to see that exponential growth of opportunity in the space. That makes sense. So we want to ask you a market question as well, and people are quite interested now. And it's an interesting parallel to the time you started Vista in 2000. Um, and we know, you know there's a lot of luck that goes into all this, and it's probably better that you started in 2000 than maybe 1997, because the market corrected itself right after, which you know, for all of us, people that had capital provided excellent uh, investing opportunities. We're sitting here in 2021, um, SPACs everywhere. I like to refer to it as SPACapalooza, um, <laughs> Robinhood, day trading, um, GameStop. Is this, is this 1999 all over again? I don't think so. I will tell you um, my perspective. One is uh, you actually have, in a, because of those forces I just named, um, you actually have a bigger, broader set of investors participating in these markets. And so on the one hand, just by the very nature of volume, you're going to have higher volatility uh, uh, in, in, in the trading uh, environment. So that's kind of point one. Point two, um, you know, you have the ability to leveraging these applications uh, to actually bring critical mass and coalescence on issues uh, that, that then create even more volatility. But what do I mean by that? Well, you can look at the platform that people are trading on, then you can look at the platforms in which they're communicating. Sometimes they converge all in one, and sometimes they're separate. But at any point in time, depending upon who you are on this planet, you can converge and you can put out a message, and a billion people will see it in minutes, and they may act on it. And so that creates a whole different dynamic of engagement uh, that if 
there is a, a capital markets component associated with it will create much more trading volume and volatility associated with it. So we're in a completely different paradigm. You know, back in 99, you know, how many people actually traded online? How many people actually had, you know, well, we didn't have smartphones, right? 06, 07, when we first started to see those, we all had the flip phones, we, you know, in memorizing numbers and all that sort of thing. Whereas today, you know, you can, you, you can use your voice to affect a trade while you're driving down the street listening to a radio show, right? So those are the, so, you know, the, the, the frequency and speed of interaction and data uh, has changed that completely. Now, how that's going to manifest and play out, we're seeing some effects of it. Volatility is one of the effects. Um, and then, of course, we're going, to have, we're going to see how the, regular, the regulators decide that they want to you know, participate uh, in, in, in the construct of those markets. So it's going to be interesting. We're, we're nowhere like 99, but I, I would tell you we're in a different paradigm that I'm not sure everyone understands quite yet. Got it. Thank you. Um, and now we'll talk a little bit about location because another place you were ahead of the curve was really moving most of your operations to Texas, to Austin. I see those two cowboy hats behind you. Um, <laughs> you know, what did you see there? Um, and, you know, if you could position that in the context of, you know, what was attractive about Austin, what's attractive about Austin today, and how can other cities uh, become tech hubs outside of Silicon Valley, attract and retain talent, provide, you know, lifestyles for, uh, for employees? Tom, that is a, a great question. I get asked that by governments, by, you know, state and local officials and politicians, et cetera. And I tell them, quite frankly, you, you know, you have to look at the business, well, for me, the business that I am in. And if you think about it, there are about seven and a half billion people on this planet. There's only 29 million of us that actually know how to write code, right? So I have to think about where do we put our centers of excellence where we can find people who not only can write code, but understand the impact of what that code is. So we look in, you know, I've got offices still in San Francisco, Chicago, you know, New York, in, uh, in Austin, and in multiple places around the globe now, uh, a few places in Asia, in India, et cetera. Well, a good part of that is, you know, we need to go where the talent is. And we need to make sure that talent has access to the, what I call the intellectual property of Vista, then ultimately the intellectual property that, it, that makes up our value creation group. And so that's what we look for. You know, we look at towns like, you know, Austin, Texas in particular, we've got a huge university system. And, you know, we'd like to draw from university students because you and I talked a little bit about it. You know, I came to computers when I was 17 years old. I'm a digital immigrant, right? We want digital natives. We want people coming out of colleges and who have, who have spent their entire world and life looking through lenses and screens, et cetera, because they see things differently. They, they engage with the world differently. Don't get me wrong. We need a full spectrum of people in our organizations, and that diversity is critically important. But it is important for us to make sure that we have a, a constant sources of talent uh, in, in our core operations. And people say, well, what do I do about it? How do I think about it? And I tell them what you need to do in America in particular is to engage and actuate every single citizen in this country. We have to have on ramps for every single person in this country to participate in the, the, this industrial, fourth industrial revolution. You know, I look to India and my friend Mikesh Ambani, who's built a, a beautiful company there, has got 400 million plus people you know, on a 4G network in the U.S., we're sitting here and we've got 40 million people who aren't. Well, OK, well, that's that's something we can solve. And so when I think about, you know, for the politicians and business people, let's focus on that. Let's focus on enabling our talented people, all of our people to participate in this economy in one way or another, which means they have to have access to that computing power. OK, they've got to have broadband access. They have to have devices. They have to have training. They have to have learning management systems that can enable them to be productive citizens in this environment. So that's really what I focus on uh, in terms of where we put our businesses and locate them and, and why we put them there. That's one of the reasons we moved to Austin. Fantastic environment for business and getting people to really, you know, young people to actually come on board and, and be a part of this journey. Um, let's wrap up with a question on uh, philanthropy, how you spend your time. Wouldn't be a conversation with Robert Smith uh, if we didn't, you're one of the leading philanthropists uh, in the country. And thank you for that. Uh, been involved with numerous organizations, really uh, too numerous to list. Um, but, you know, uh, Columbia Business School and Morehouse and Cornell, um, Carnegie Hall, uh, the Fund 2 Foundation, which you founded, 
um, and are the lead director there. Uh, so really a, a two part question, you know, how, you might, you're getting calls every day. Uh, how do you think about where you spend your time? What's important to you? Um, and then, you know, part of that is, you know, bridging the digital, uh, the digital divide. Um, and, you know, how do we think about that? And I know this is something we could talk about uh, for, but this, this summit is for a better future um, and nothing implies for a better future more directly than philanthropy. It's all about building a better future. Yeah. And a big part of it, Tom, again, thematically, it comes down to some very basic themes for me. And one of the most important in the context of what we're discussing is bridging the opportunity gap. You know, I look, you know, as a child of school, school teachers who, who never, you know, understood computers and those sort of things, the gap was bridged for me through a great teacher and then ultimately an opportunity, which was an internship and then ultimately access to computing power. And so there's still citizens in our country, <laughs> many of them, um, you know, black and brown students who don't have that access. So I'm saying, well, well, what I should do is use my platform, my opportunity to bridge that. And I just, you know, one of my friends, Chuck Robbins over at Cisco, they just made a $150 million donation to enable, okay, every one of the historically black colleges and universities to now come to a 4G standard. Think about that. Now you have access for this whole generation of students to have, have, have um, you know, 4G, you know, compute and you can software upgrade to 5G so that they now can all participate in the global economy that is that is digital in nature. Those are the sort of activities to me that, that, okay, that are important for me to spend my time, energy and effort on. I'm also a member of the World Economic Forum, and one of the things we're focused on there is probably the Edison Alliance and its largest CEOs and CFOs of companies in the world. And we're focused on, okay, how do we also do that, not just in the U.S., but other parts of the world where, we, where they also have digital divides? We've got the capacity in terms of the, comp or the capability, in terms of the companies, the knowledge, the technology. Now, how do we do the funding? And so there's various ways that we're saying, how do we create you know, standards? And here's how you go do this funding and bond financing or bank financing to enable you know, that, that to happen efficiently for, for, for communities. You know, the business roundtable, the same thing, 2% solution. How do we now get these companies to say, all right, guess what? I actually provide broadband service in that state or that community. And I see we've got gaps in terms of where these schools are located. Let's provide that there. Also, let's provide, you know, capital for the small to medium businesses once you have, the, you know, digital infrastructure. So what it really is, is providing, you know, I'll call it the on-ramps and, and, uh, into the opportunity set uh, that the digital economy does uh, does provide uh, for people who haven't had that access in the past. Robert, thank you for that. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the partnership. I wish we had some more time. There's a lot more to talk about. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Tom. All the best and congratulations and good luck on the conference.